Hello and welcome to the Gambling Files podcast, the podcast that likes to think it can surf, but in fact, it's just a fat man on a bodyboard. I'm one of your hosts, John Bruford, joined by your other host, Mr. Fenton Costello. If anybody's having struggling, struggling to tell us apart, if you're watching in black and white, Fenton's the one with the hair. Fenton, hello. Hello, John. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. I am. I am a little bit tired today, I must admit. It's... Oh. Easter holidays, and the kids have been here. Fern was um, Fern was uh, uh, away on a break with her chap, so um, nice. I had the kids here. Um, and That's good. Well, for them, the big news was Annie lost a tooth, um, so that was good. So yeah, it's good. Um, oh, she was very sick the one night. So, oof. That got very complicated very quickly as well. Uh, baby Al was his usual fairly hilarious self. And uh, Joe, Joe turns nine on Friday. Oh, it's a big age. It's a, it's a big, big age. One. Yeah. But, um, you know, they're, they're great kids. I'm a big fan. But it's it's really cool. I just I messaged Fern a minute ago. She's like, it must be really quiet there now. And I'm like, I have to I have to clap every so often to make sure that I'm not deaf. <laughs> it's just oh thank God. Oh. But yeah, I am I'm, I'm very, very tired. Mm. Um what's what's the life on sabbatical like? Yeah, it's good. It's um, I've been exercising, which is nice. I've got back into back into a new routine. Got a new training plan. So all my sorry, bits ache. The, the, the only... dog in the background there. I'm sorry about that. Um, all my all my bits ache, which is which is good. I've earned it. Um, yeah, just chilling out. Really, it's, it's nice. Does sound Thinking nice. the big thoughts. Yeah. Thinking the big thoughts. That's the one. I've I've thought at various points in my life, but uh, I'm not sure any of them have ever been big thoughts. That was the dog as well. That was me. I'm not in the back. I'm not just grunting to myself here. I'm not just... So, but we had uh, one of Fern's dogs here while they were away as well. So the house was really full, really full. Yeah. Do you have Amazon Prime? Uh, I did, but I cancelled it. Because mm. it, it doesn't really, it's not really set up here properly. So it's, it all comes from Germany. So it's not as good as it would be, say, in the UK. Yeah. But the Dutch have a much better the e-commerce in the Netherlands has been amazing forever. Like you can do nearly all the websites here do next day delivery or same day delivery. Um, uh, it's pretty so small it's, country. There's a lot more competition. It's a pretty small country. And it's got a really good road network um, yeah. because of Rotterdam and stuff. So it's a, yeah, it, getting next day delivery or like have it before lunch the next day. If you order it by midnight is super common across the board. I saw a thing on Amazon, right? Which was... It was like choose your designated days, and you can choose a couple of days in a week where your stuff will be delivered. Like if you've done multiple things, if so you've oh, done so multiple they can, they can. Yeah, it's almost like the opposite of next day delivery. Well, their biggest cost is delivery, and their biggest headache is delivery. The inventory they figured out, they've outsourced that to everybody, um, or they've outsourced the purchasing of inventory. So they're basically a warehouse provider. Their biggest issue is that kind of last mile concept of getting you your box. Um, it's true. And, you know, all since COVID, all courier networks, companies are just like at capacity and just barely holding on. So it makes, it makes sense. Yeah. 
But I'm a little bit tits off that Prime uh, Prime Video now has fucking adverts on. Oh, but oh, if I want the adverts, oh, if I want the adverts to go, I, I can do that if I pay them more. But I paid you for it without. Yeah, it's coming full circle. Um, I got rid of it. I've, I've kept. I've kept Netflix and Disney Plus. I got rid of the Amazon one and the Apple one. I've just yeah. signed up for I think it's three months of Apple TV because I, I I had to buy another tablet for the kids at the weekend. So I signed up for that just so I can watch Slow Horses season three. Oh, have they done season season three? Yeah, it does look good. And then I'll probably have to buy another tablet at some point in about a year. So then I'll presumably get season four. Or Ted Lasso. <laughs> I've done Ted. There must, there must be another. I oh, know they've, no, they've Ted, finished Ted's Ted Lasso. Done. Ted's done. Ted's dead. Ted's dead, baby. But I miss, um, I miss Hannah Waddingham of, of Ted Lasso. She's, she's just magnificent. Mm. She's Wonderful. fabulous. Wonderful. Yeah, I agree. Um, and, um, let me, let me think, uh, so why, why did I get onto Amazon? It was I, the I can't remember. delivery stuff. No, 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 that no, wasn't why about, I like... initially pivoted there. I, just, I don't know why. Maybe I started Fair watching enough. the remake of Roadhouse last night. Oh, okay. And it was a lot of fun. I haven't finished watching it because... I'm old. I tend to watch movies in two or three chunks these days, even the 90 minute movies. It's not just ones that are over two hours, <laughs> but it was, it was a lot of fun. And, uh, Conor McGregor seems to have quite a significant role in it. You, you probably know him. He's Irish. I've heard of him. Yeah. Oh, did he get big after you moved away? He's, pr <laughs> he's probably heard of you. <laughs> at this point <laughs> who the fuck's that guy I think would be the response <laughs> uh, but yeah he, he seems to be in it I mean he's he's quite literally chewing the scenery um, but it seems well, to be having a really good habit. time <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't possibly comment you know him I don't the alleged <laughs> yeah he's uh... anyway but it's 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 a very fun movie so far, the last 45 have, minutes could be shite. I, I, I haven't seen the original either, so it'll be, it'll be coming in fresh. What? I know. Yeah. Who the fuck hasn't seen Roadhouse? Was, I, I hesitated at even mentioning it because I knew we were just about to derail this, <laughs> this intro <laughs> while you lecture me. <laughs> it's fucking, dude, it's Roadhouse. Yeah, I've, I just missed it. I don't know. Oh. It happens. It happens. I mean, it's, it's this it's is why we talk. You educate me. You bring almost up the, you know. perfect slice of late eighties, early nineties action cheese, and and I would actually go so far as to say that it's the second best thing Patrick Swayze ever did, and it's it's his best leading role. His best movie is obviously The Outsiders, um, and he's phenomenal in The Outsiders. But Roadhouse is it's just like it's so beautifully over the top and do you, do you reckon do you reckon all our female do you reckon all the female listeners are like no 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 it's dirty dancing that was no crazy, right? no no I, I don't think i don't think people will be disagreeing everybody appreciates dirty dancing and and fair enough it's it's a lot of fun but he does Topless Tai Chi in Roadhouse. And I think that that would be the clincher for many ladies. <laughs> um, there, there, there's not been a point in his life where he is more buff than he is in Roadhouse. Okay. Because okay. the level of confidence for topless Tai Chi has got to be, it's, it's good. It's, okay. Astro, it's okay. even higher than my day to day confidence, Fintan. And that is saying something. Um, saying a lot. Saying a lot. Seriously, I remember this, this is wildly personal story i should probably never relate this to you but i do remember i was, I was with a, a, a let's call her a special lady friend in my 20s and um and i was a raging alcoholic and sorry i had a ragingly what's the word abusive relationship with alcohol 
and was really fat. I was drinking shitless when I was living in London. I was basically going out for pizza and having fucking champagne with it. <laughs> all, all kinds of silly shit. And I was real, I got really big. Um, and um, and I just remember, I, you know, I got out of bed, strutted across the room and she just, and I, I'd known this woman for years and years and years. And she just looked at me, she went, where did you get that body confidence from? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know now that you ask, <laughs> but let's not delve too much into why you asked me that. Um, but yeah, good times, good times. Um, but whenever I think of Roadhouse, this is really sad. Mm. I think of the number one two eight two because that was the number okay. of the video in the video shop I worked in when I was fifteen. <laughs> But it was a movie that was rented almost every day. I mean, it was popular mm -hmm. and it stayed popular for years. There were some movies that did nothing at the cinema. But on the home rental market, they were absolute smash hits. But, but, but that was one of the things that completely destroyed the movie industry economics was the, the secondaries from VHS and DVD rentals. It's a well, huge business. It, it, it didn't. It didn't wreck it. I mean, it's it's it was new income. It was like entirely new. Well, that's what I mean. Well, like when it disappeared. No, no, what I mean is, it but it fucked up the cinemas. Income. It. But then when it disappeared, like when everything went to streaming, and you mm. don't have because they're not making the same from the streaming as they are from the the DVD rentals. So no, it's completely. Um, I've seen some. Okay, you, you, I look. You're the expert, but I thought there was a there was a whole thing about that. I, I'm 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 not an expert by any stretch of the imagination. Well, you're more of an expert in this topic than I am. What what you what you had was obviously you had theatrical rentals, um, mm. and that was that was what underpinned everything for movie studios. Video comes along, whole new whole new um, income, um, and. Um, you you had little studios popping up who were just getting the rights to old stuff and putting it out there because no videos the, there was not a wide range mm. of videos available. Charles Band's entire early career was 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 based on this. He actually licensed Texas Chainsaw Massacre and put it out on home video. Um, I've just realised that I'm I've just said that to you like you're going to know who Charles Band is, um, <laughs> indie horror producer. Fa the thing he's probably most famous for is that he had a relationship with Demi Moore when, when she was about 19, I think. And he would have been probably in his mid twenties. Anyway, he doesn't mention it on his podcast. Fuck, you know, he really does. Anyway, I, I'm getting sidetracked here. So, so then you've got that income and then the studios get wise to it and they're like, Oh, we could put our old library back out. We could get income from all of that jazz and blah, blah, blah. Mm. And they get smarter about it. And then, you know, DVD appears and, oh, well, people are going to need to replace their stuff. And, you know, they get into the idea of remastering stuff and, and it's some really wonderful stuff that was restored. Um, and a shitload of stuff has been lost forever as well. Um, and, yeah, like you say, you know, then there's there's loads of men. And then there's Blu-ray and uh, Blu-ray wasn't ever as big as DVD, but, you know, it was more income and there was Laserdisc before all of that as well. But I think with the streaming thing and, and one of the major issues with the streaming thing is that they want to make as much money as they can on their libraries. Mm. So you've got a Paramount channel you've got an mgm channel you've got blah blah nobody's loyal to fucking studios people will use these why, things it's, for it's a couple of months and then disappear somewhere else it's what i loved about sony's approach it's a, sony literally said we will be the arms dealer and just license our catalogs to everybody it's the only way um, it is genuinely it's the only way um one of the things that makes disney plus um, such a, a good resource apart from the fact that it's got bluey um, but apart from that it, it's the the studios they've they've acquired it's not the Disney stuff no it's if you look if you've got a kid you've got to have Disney plus um, if you want bluey you've got to have Disney plus I know you can get some of it on the BBC but bluey man 
Um, so, it, so now you've got this this whole fragmented thing in in streaming, and it's a pain in the ass. It's a pain in the ass to find library stuff. It's a pain in the ass to find old stuff. I've still got a DVD player because you know I do like some fairly extremely niche stuff, and I can't <laughs> find it streaming. I can't. I was like, the well, movie come- I most want to watch at the moment is Wendy and Lucy. Can't find it anywhere. It's only made about eight years ago the fuck and if anybody out there hasn't seen it go see wendy and lucy it's fantastic talking of fantastic oh um we had a great guest yesterday but and... did you tell did you tell the great guest oh hang on first things first sorry i wasn't here yeah yeah um... and did you tell him about our sponsors because we've got two sponsors i didn't mention our sponsors um we should mention our sponsors so we've got the wonderful clarion clarion um, gaming who are clarion gaming who are the proud organizers professional organizers of igb amsterdam which is coming coming up soon 16th to the 19th of july um must attend event uh, give me a shout if you're in town um we also have OptiMove, who've just finished their OptiMove Connect. They had their big, big event in London uh, last week. It looked really good. And they are the number one iGaming CRM supplier in the industry, hands down. And I can see why it's a really good tool. You should totally use it. It is. As we like to say, um, go get the demo. Yeah. Oh, hang on. Just, just before you tell me about our guest, I do want to say mm-hmm. Roadhouse was one of those movies that was an absolute huge hit on on home rentals and it was it was massive right mm. did nothing at the box office nothing at all it was you know i mean it was probably just about made its money back but so what hugely profitable on on dvd and video the big one though was for my generation was a movie called the hitcher which you know it's i mean it's a terrific film it really is a good movie would have worked well at the cinema etc but on video seriously it was in the rentals charts for years it was such a good movie and the only place you could get to see it was on video and it made it so Rutger Hauer was reasonably well known had been in Blade Runner etc and you know obviously you're in Holland so you obviously know who he is um he's probably Probably the most famous Dutch actor ever, I would think. I've got no clue who he is. Have you seen Blade Runner? Yeah, but I was really young. Okay, well, he's the main replicant in Blade Runner. He's a very striking chap. Uh, he's the head vampire in the movie of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. He pops oh, okay. up in a lot that of things. That one I know. That one I know. Um, and and fabulously talented man, but it was the hitcher that made him like a big star. I mean, he'd been in stuff. He'd been in. There was a Stallone movie called Nighthawks, which is actually very good. Um, there was Blade Runner. There was things where he was a supporting actor, or he was a villain, or whatever. But it was the hitcher that put him over the top in in terms of consciousness of of recognition. Um, yeah, uh, it's just one of those odd things. But again, it's a movie did nothing at the box office, nothing at all, just was so what but on video word of mouth people talking Mm. to each other flu anyway so tell me who did you get on as a guest and how did you you find them (laughs) yeah you did all the hard work and then thanks you know didn't show up Um, yeah sorry about that so i was explaining to the guest it was your hair transplant procedure went badly wrong and um, it really did it all slid down it did it (laughs) <laughs> the graph didn't didn't take. Um, so we have uh, Michael Schaus of uh, what's the name of Schaus, ShausCreative.com. Um, Michael is also an opinion columnist, and he's a cigar and whiskey aficionado expert, something like that. Yeah, he's an so aficionado. So, the, so I, I was reading um, an op-ed piece that he did in the Nevada Independent uh last week 
um, about the Formula One race and its supposed economic benefits for the Las Vegas area. And he, he wrote, a, it was a really, really well put together takedown of, of that. He, he's super smart and you can see why it was so, like he's, he was fabulous. So we, so we talk about that. So we talk about F1, we talk about Vegas, we talk about Vegas as a destination for these events. We talk about the A's and I tested your hypothesis. Oh yeah. That it's, that it's not going to happen. Yeah. And he tells, oh, he tells man, us. You're not going to tell me, yeah. I'm going to have to listen to the, your episode. Um, it'll make a change. <laughs> it's usually me. Um, we then talk about, so I'm kind of planning ahead to G2E. Um, and so he gives his recommendations of the best cigar bars in Vegas. Um, introduced me to a new, uh, a couple of new co- cocktail concept or a new cocktail concept, which I'd never heard of before. Um, so we talk about that. We talk about buying cigars. Um, we talk about whiskey. Um, we talk about his favorite whiskey and yeah, he's just, then we talk about creative and his agency and the, all the clever things he's doing for his, for his clients. And yeah, he's a really nice guy. Super smart. Well, I had high hopes and I I did really want to be here. Just, you know, Easter holidays and the kids. Yeah. 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 And they, they were just, they, I had to take them for their rabies shots. Um, I wouldn't have had to, but I bit them all. <laughs> I'm a <laughs> terrible, <laughs> terrible parent. Um, but no, I'm really sorry that I missed it. And, um, and I hope that he will be, uh, he'll be coming back. I think I, it, it has the feeling of a friend of a pod of the podcast. Um, and I'm very, very sure we'll have him back many, many times. Cool. Well, should we go and meet him? Let's do it. Enjoy the pod. Hello and welcome to The Gambling Files. And you're right, this isn't John doing the introduction. It's Finton. John is off busy getting his new hair implants treated. Um, there was a little bit of an infection. It got a bit messy. I've seen the pictures. It's, it's horrible. So we're going to give him a little bit of time to recover. And since we've moved on to video, he just can't be here right now. So we'll, we'll let John crack on with that. And Godspeed, John. Godspeed. We miss you. Um, today's guest, uh, this week's guest, is Michael Schaus, uh, owner of Schaus Creative. Uh, Michael's also an opinion, col- opinion columnist. Sorry. And I'm going to call it Substack Genius. He's got a fantastic Substack as well. And we'll put the, the links into all of those in the notes after this. Um, Michael, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, very happy um, to be here. We, we saw your article on the Nevada Independent and we loved it. And we're like, oh my God, we've got to speak to Michael. This is brilliant. So the context um, for new listeners and probably a bit of context for Michael as well, as he says, they're going, like, what's going on here? Is myself and John, we've been huge fans of the, the evolution of the Las Vegas strategy. Um, John's a very hardcore Las Vegas, knows all about Las Vegas and all bits of Las Vegas. I'm more an outsider marketing nerd kind of fan, but the evolution of Las Vegas of, you know, you know, there's residencies and then it's the, you say things like the UFC um, getting the NFL team, um, hockey team, like so really making Vegas a great destination for a weekend and a lot of like stuff outside of the casino floor that really kind of pull people in. Um, I'm a huge F1 fan. I, I got up at five o'clock in the morning um, to watch the Australian race at the weekend. Um, that's how much I like Formula One. Um, I did fall asleep through it, but anyway, it's a different story. Um, I'm a huge F1 fan and the F the, the Vegas race looked fantastic on TV. I think the, is it the, the Vegas Eye? Is that what it's called? Uh, the, the big sphere, yeah. The sphere, it's... that's it. Just unbelievable branding it's for stunning. the sphere amazing that is it is incredible you can actually see the sphere and every time i look at it i think well i'm living in a movie set it's it's amazing living out it's, here it's crazy and you got the and they they really had good fun with it but vegas looked amazing it was jumping there was the hype all week and it was much better than say the miami kind of the miami race so from it feels like for me as an F1 fan, the the Vegas race felt like the first possible race that could compete with, say, Monaco in terms of just 
VIP, celebrity, bling, party weekend, the place you want to be. Um, and but then we read your article and it's like, oh, hang on a minute. Maybe it's not all as good as it seems behind the scenes. So can you kind of talk a little bit about kind of just yeah. explain to everybody what's going on? There, there's definitely kind of a darker underside there um, when it comes to F1. And, and you know, I'll state, first of all, I do like F1. Um, I just kind of a, I love cars anyway. So any motorsport, I'm already, already magically drawn to. Uh, so I was very excited when F1 was coming to Las Vegas, but there was a big question mark there about, okay, was it really going to be the big, great event for Vegas that everybody thought it would be? And mm. certainly it brought in a lot of attention. It brought in a lot of business, it brought in a lot of money, but only for a very kind of select few, uh, the big resorts that you know of, you know, MGM and Caesars and things like that, they certainly got their share of the money. Um, and it was, it was a very successful weekend for them, but everybody else really saw a lot of damage. I mean, there was massive disruption, obviously, to the roadways, but also just pedestrian traffic. Yeah. Um, a lot of the shows, Absinthe, which is one of the largest shows in Las Vegas, had to shut down for that entire weekend. So really? everybody involved with that show made no money. They actually lost money, even though we had supposedly $1.5 billion in impact here. Um, and there have been a lot of businesses. In fact, there's even talk about a lawsuit because a lot of the businesses had to lay off half of their workers and they saw their millions and millions of dollars uh, go out the door because all the foot traffic that normally they would depend on for an event like that was mm. completely gone in, in given the way that F1 shut down access to so much of the strip. So there was definitely a, definitely a downside there that probably needs to be discussed, especially if we're going to continue to do this every single year for the next 10 years. And, and because it's the, the F1, the F1 track itself is actually quite unique in Vegas because it's the the only track that Formula One itself owns. Yeah, um, usually they're they're licensed and they're so they're, so clearly like the plan is it's going to be here for a long time. Yeah, um, but but how would you like how do you make this equitable among the properties? Like how what would that look like? So it's it's kind of a difficult question. I think it's something that F1 and the county should have discussed uh long before they actually moved it here because part of it is you know, part of it's kind of excusable just because of the reality of politics you've got local mm. governments they're going to be very receptive to the big corporations just because that's the way that politics work uh not just here in las vegas but kind of everywhere uh that being said f1 really did not go out of its way to ask local businesses what they can do to make them feel included. In fact, it was the exact opposite. Before the race happened last year, F1 was going around to a lot of the venues that had a glimpse of the track and basically showing up and saying, hey, nice view you got here. Uh, be a shame if somebody just built an obstruction right here so you couldn't see the track. And they were asking for fees from all these small time, small businesses that happened to have a view wow. of the track. And you know, for a lot of these businesses, the fees that they were asking was just unreasonable. It was, I think, worked out to be about $1,500 per person that was allowed by your fire code. So if you could allow 500 people in your restaurant, you had to pay $1,500 for the total per five, you know, per person up to 500 people. And um, that was that was rough. So a lot of these businesses saw themselves kind of being pushed out, having barricades built up in front of them. And they weren't part of that event, that that great, awesome, spectacular weekend that took place. But what's crazy about that is, like, again, if we take Monaco as the example, like, it doesn't happen there. Right. And and it doesn't even happen throughout a lot of the rest of the United States. I mean, the, the one that took place down in Texas, I had a family member go to that race. And they said, you could actually find areas, just, like, go walk up on the hill, set out a little blanket, and catch a glimpse of the track. And here in Vegas, they... It was it was pretty insane the way that they were going above and beyond to make sure if you did not pay Liberty Media some yeah. sort of money, you were not going to see any of the track. They were even putting up uh, – we've got these pedestrian cross bridges that go over. I saw And they that, were yeah. frosting out the glass so nobody could stop. They wanted to even pass a law saying that nobody could stop on those bridges. But there was, was people constantly going up and down on the uh, escalators. Yeah. Just and to watch and the race. some of the barricades, even, you know, people would tear them down. So they'd have to put them back up the next day. I mean, <laughs> it was, it, it seemed like a wasted effort on their part, too. But um, that just kind of goes to show you part of the problem there was, yeah, of course, you're going to shut down an entire resort corridor and turn it into a racetrack. 
that's going to cause problems and it's going to be a disruption. Mm. But um, I think it was worse than most people were expecting. I think a lot of yeah. small businesses knew it was going to be an inconvenience, especially as they were repaving everything and going through the yeah. preparations. But uh, they really felt like they were very much shut out of everything that happened that weekend. And But it was also like one of the things that jumped out was the the, the county itself lost money. Oh, yeah. Um, so <laughs> you, you had like, what was it? 3.8 million in tax revenue, which feels on the low side given right. how much they were shaking down the rest like resorts for but there was 4.3 million on staff costs yeah this was this was kind of one of the untold uh stories at least up until recently part of the reason why i think the the politicians were so behind this and they weren't really pushing f1 to be more inclusive with the regular community was they really thought that this was going to be a windfall uh for the city they thought you know 1.5 billion dollars in economic activity was going to come into las vegas even if that was mostly concentrated in the big luxury resorts, look at all the tax revenue we're going to get. Think about all the things we can do. And instead, they spent yeah four point something million dollars uh, on just staff costs alone, trying mm -hmm. to get permits going, trying to uh, help with the paddock building and all this stuff. And all of a sudden, they lost half a million dollars. Um, so they didn't even get the windfall. Even the county didn't get the windfall that they were expecting. So it looks like the money that came into town, certainly there was plenty of money that came into town, but it was very, very concentrated. And he did not see that big economic benefit that I think most people were were being yeah. told. And and so how does the the uh, how does the hierarchy work then in, in Vegas? Because like, if you look ahead to like the future years, because clearly there's a problem. So the, the county lost money. Uh, lots of small businesses lost money. Uh, lots of, say, even medium-sized resorts lost money or had a bad time. And it concentrated in the, the few mega resorts um, that took most of the benefit. Do they have enough clout to kind of go, this is great, we're definitely doing it again? Or is it a bit more, actually, guys, this isn't a sure thing? I, I think they definitely have clout. Certainly, they'll they'll get the next few years. I mean, I think there was a total of three years that were basically guaranteed. So they've got two more years to try to figure this out and make it palatable to the rest of Vegas. Um, if, let's say, after those two years, it turns out to be a disaster year after year for a lot of uh, Las Vegas locals and, and mm. smaller businesses, I do think it's quite possible that the county commission is going to say, look, w other things have to change. Um, and maybe that means changing the layout of the track a little bit. Maybe that means changing the way that we let pedestrian traffic flow. Um, but there's going to have to be something there to make the broader community feel like they're a part of things. Mm. Otherwise, you're going to have the political pressure there that it doesn't matter how big those, those few resorts are. You've got enough other voices there that all of a sudden the county commissioners are going to say, hey, look, we might be in political trouble if we don't try to do yeah. something different. Of course, um, And that's really where I think most of the impetus is going to come from because, you know, getting reelected, that matters apparently to politicians. <laughs> <laughs> so, but when you think of like the lead time it would take to make changes, if they're not having those discussions now, it's definitely not happening this year. Yeah. And this was one of the things watching F1 play out last year. It was, um, it was interesting because when it was first announced that F1 was going to come, uh, the first thought that I had was, okay, this is going to be a lot of work that has to happen in a very short amount of time. And certainly that's what happened. Uh, the problem was the communication breakdown between F1, county commissioners, and the small businesses. It, it was, there really was no communication there. Uh, routinely, F1 would be doing something on the paddock building, for example, and then all of a sudden that county would be like, hey, you're supposed to have a permit for that. Um, so there was not, it, it wasn't organized as well as it should which again, understandable. There was a lot to do in a very short amount of time. Mm. Uh, going forward now, the question is, yeah, I think over the next few months, we'll have an idea of whether or not that, those communication breakdowns have been fixed. So far, it doesn't really seem like it. F1 started to announce tickets for the next race before they even had official permission for that weekend from, from the county. Now, of course, they'll get permission for that, but goes to show you, yeah, they're maybe not really taking that communication breakdown seriously. So I think that's going to be the big tell over the course of the next couple of years, if they can fix some of that. And if you mm. actually have people sitting down with F1 and the county saying, these are the things that need to happen before you guys move gung-ho with your, with your next event, 
then you might actually see some of these problems be addressed. Until then, I think it's going to be quite possibly a repeat of last year. Maybe not quite as bad because they don't have quite as much preparation to do, but it's still going to be really rough for a lot of those smaller resorts and smaller businesses. And what do you feel like some of the remedies could be for the, say, the smaller resorts? Yeah, I mean, there are a couple of county commissioners talking about figuring out some way to compensate these businesses that had to, for example, shut down. I mean, Mm. some of these businesses, there's just no real way to get around it. Uh, You know, if if they are a, there's a, uh, a convenience store, for example, and a petrol station right there that obviously they get shut down because the course goes right through it and F1 doesn't have to stop to get your gasoline. Um, You know, so there's clearly that's going to be a challenge for them. The question that I have is where on earth is that money for those comp- for that compensation going to come from? Obviously, mm. it's not coming from the county. The county lost half a million dollars. So how do you organize with potentially F1 to say, what do we do about some of these businesses that we can't necessarily make them a part of, the, a part of things, a part of the event? Um, mm. I think the bigger, probably the more reasonable approach to take is look at those smaller venues and say, is there something we can do, some sort of a community event that we can do that will make it worth it? You know, I mean, for sure, the Bellagio, for example, took a cost in all the preparation. They had to cut down some trees. They had to set up big stands. But those costs were worth it to the Bellagio because they knew that they were going to make it back in ticket revenue and room rates and everything else. Some of the smaller businesses, if they don't have foot traffic, it's just not worth it. So you have to, as F1, I think, you have to come up with a way to say, what can we do to make it worth it for them? So that way they're happy about, look, I'll suffer for a weekend because here's what I'm going to get after it. Mm. And until that conversation's had, it's going to be going to be an uphill battle, I think, in a lot of the local community behind them. Yeah, which is interesting because there's obviously like multiple um around the world there's multiple city races so this isn't the only city on this on the right. f1 calendar that gets shut down for a weekend while they they run stuff so i think it'd be I, I, i'm not sure what happens elsewhere um, well and i it's think it's not unique part of it might be everybody likes to think that las vegas is very different uh we hear this all the time you know they're talking about building a new uh a new stadium for a baseball team and Everywhere else in America, every economic study says that this doesn't work out. This, you know, the state or the yeah. county is going to end up losing money. And the analysts here in Las Vegas always say, oh, yeah, but Vegas is different. Um, and to a certain extent, they're right. I mean, Vegas is different. It's a very unique place. But there are still some basic truths. And I think going into F1, they thought, oh, Vegas is very different. It's this big resort destination anyway. Mm. Maybe we don't have to do the things that we do in other states. Uh, or or in other city locations, or in Monaco, for example. And so maybe they thought they could get away with doing it different here. But I think that there's still a you know, some universal truths. Like it doesn't matter how many big resorts we have along that raceway, yeah. there's still a lot of smaller businesses that you still have to pay attention to. Yeah, I agree. So on the on the on the baseball stadium and the the, the A's coming to Vegas, um, John has a theory, and he wants Uh-oh. me to th- he wanted me to to run his theory by you. He reckons there's no baseball team coming to Vegas and it's just a bargaining chip to get better tax con- tax concessions in Oakland. Uh, what very, are your thoughts? Very possible. Um, this, is, and this is not an outlandish theory, by the way. I mean, several years ago, they were talking about this as well. And they were, they were pretty open about the fact that they were using, uh, they were pitting Las Vegas against Oakland to try to get a better deal in Oakland. Um, and if you look at the way that John Fisher, the owner of the A's, has gone about this whole thing, yeah, I mean, you think F1 had a communication breakdown. The Oakland A's has been communication nightmare. Uh, they have not been coordinating with even themselves, let alone the county or what have you. Uh, they, they got the bill passed um, up in Carson City, the state capital, to get $380 million. And at the time, they showed us this beautiful picture of this wonderful stadium they were going to build right there on the Las Vegas Strip. And then right after the bill gets passed, they go, actually, that's not what it's going to look like. We have to get back to the drawing board. And so we just now got, quote unquote, official renderings. But even those official renderings, people are looking at it going, I don't think that's going to fit on the nine acres you say it's going to fit on. So it's it doesn't feel like they're taking it as seriously as somebody that would really want to move here. So I wouldn't be surprised if 
it is some sort of a ploy to get some more concessions mm. from Oakland. I'm not sure that that's going to work for them. Um, we might begrudgingly end up with a baseball team here, uh, but it's, it's going to be interesting. And yeah, I, I've got a whole host of problems there just politically how the whole thing unfolded, but it's um, yeah, it's a likely theory, I think. Okay. Okay. He'll be delighted to hear that. And <laughs> if it, okay, if, if the, the Oaklands do move to Vegas, is it, you know, I, I think there's talks of, or there was some of the stuff I've seen is like, it won't even, they won't even fill the stadium on a regular basis. Is that Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know how closely you follow you know, American sports like baseball, but um, just to put it all into perspective, the A's have one of the worst records in baseball. So they're already not a great team. And that kind of hurts me to say it because I, I wish just for the people of Oakland, I wish that they were better. But um, halfway through the season last year, they had actually the worst record in all of Major League Baseball history. Uh, luckily, they're not that bad anymore. They happen to win a couple of games. But there's there's a definite problem there when it comes to the quality of play, and that is translated into people not showing up. I mean, they cannot fill their current stadium in Oakland. Uh, they have significant trouble bringing people in on a regular basis. Bringing them to the Strip might help a little bit because you are in Las Vegas. People might come here to visit and see the other team uh, mm. beat the Oakland A's. But there's there's still a very big question mark of, are you going to be able to fill – that stadium for 85 home games. And that seems like a really big ask for one of the worst teams in all of major league baseball, um, especially when even good teams are having difficulty filling their stadiums. So there's a big economic if, if, question there. And then on the, on the practical side of things, because you, you've obviously got, there's a, there's an NFL team. There's a, there's a hockey team. So you've got all these highly paid athletes. H how can you like young, highly paid athletes in Vegas? How conducive is that to like just getting in trouble? Yeah, it's uh, it's been interesting so far. The the Las Vegas Golden Knights, which is the hockey team, uh, first of all, I'm a huge fan because I've always loved hockey. Um, but also they've they kind of did it the right way. They did it all privately funded. Uh, T-Mobile Stadium uh, Arena, which is where they play, was actually funded by MGM. Uh, Bill Foley is the owner. He said straight out, I'm not going to ask government for any subsidies. And lo and behold, they became a championship team within six years. Um, and on a practical level, most of the players have stayed out of trouble. They've all been actually really you know, good forces within the community. Most of them have set up hockey camps. I mean, all sorts of things. Oh, that's which, great. Yeah, hockey in the middle of the Mojave Desert is still a <laughs> weird thing to me. But um, And then on the other side of that, you've got the Las Vegas Raiders. And the Raiders have always kind of been known for having a reputation anyway. And you mm -hmm. have seen some of their players actually get into some trouble. And I think to your point, it's kind of a natural consequence. It's, and it's not unique to Las Vegas, but it's definitely worse in Las Vegas. Cause as it turns out, there are a lot of ways to get into trouble in this wonderful city. And so you've got a lot of people who have a lot of money and celebrity walking around each week. That's uh, it's going to cause a lot of temptation. So the league is going to have to really take that seriously too. Yeah. You could imagine just the, you know, the casino VIP managers just licking their lips kind of thing. Right? <laughs> yes. it's, just, it's perfect. It's exactly what you want on your right yeah. on your doorstep. They're here. And I day. can understand them. You know, if I was 20 something years old with millions of dollars walking through Las Vegas, I'd probably cause trouble too. Yeah. Yeah. Indeed. Um, right. Next question for you is, so for the listeners who don't know, um, Michael is also a cigar and whiskey expert, I believe. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I uh, love cigars and whiskey, usually together. Usually together. And um, I, unfortunately I had a very bad incident as a teenager with whiskey. Um, so my body physically reacts <laughs> to even the smell of whiskey still, uh, as some sort of self-preservation mechanism, which as an Irishman obviously is clearly devastating um and the amount of great bottles of whiskey i've been gifted that i just physically can't drink and um, so i've got a great friend who loves whiskey and he's just can't wait he can't wait for christmas to see what finton's going to get the post um but cigars um i've always enjoyed a cigar um and i'm just slowly starting to get into cigars a little bit um <laughs> So I've got two questions. So first question is more of a generic question. So I'm going to be going to Vegas for G2E. Uh, I think it's in September, October time, that time of year. 
if I wanted to go somewhere great in Las Vegas to smoke a cigar, what would you recommend? Uh, first place that comes to mind is one of my favorite places in Las Vegas. It's called Davidov of Geneva. And okay. it's um, at the Fashion Show Mall. So it's right across the Las Vegas Strip from the Wynn uh, and mm-hmm. the Encore. And it's a it's a small location. It's It's pretty small. Hopefully the weather's still good because they have a wonderful outdoor patio, but you can also sit inside uh, and enjoy your cigar. And they've got a very good selection. Obviously, Davidov is a cigar manufacturer, so all of their cigars. Um, But they've got other cigars as well. They've got a pretty good little collection of humidors. And they're getting more and more of the cigars that I really like, which are the smaller kind of new brands. So uh, Warped is one of the ones that I absolutely love. Uh, I think the guy's name is Kyle Gellis who started it. But it's a small kind of unknown brand uh, that's starting to win a lot of awards from cigar aficionado and the like. And Davidov is starting to pick up a lot of those um, at that location. So it's, it's a great place. And if you don't have your own cigars, they've got a great selection. If you have your own cigars, it's still a wonderful location and they have things other than whiskey. So if you can't drink whiskey, which I feel bad for you, uh, know, they can still make you any cocktail that you want a uh, full bar. And they've got, some Oh, so you can, you can, Oh, of course. Cause you can, so I'm so used to cigar bars where you can't drink. You can only smoke a cigar. Um, yeah, this is uh, one of the things living in Vegas spoils me because I can go places and drink and smoke and even drink and eat and smoke. And then I go somewhere else and uh, you go to into the cigar bar and you can't have any alcohol or anything. That's I'm like, it, oh, this is what the rest of the world looks like. I forget. <laughs> <laughs> Savages. <laughs> okay. So now I'm really excited about my trip. Okay. So that's your that's your number one choice. What's your number two choice? Um, there's a cigar bar in Caesars, um, and I can't remember the name of it, but it's right there in the forum shops. Uh, and they've actually got a very good selection as well, but their bar there is really fantastic. They do a lot of, it's kind of Cuban inspired. So they do a lot Mm -hmm. of Cuban cocktails and Latin American stuff. And, um, they've, they're really nice if you're going to go there and if you're going to be watching any sports, because they do have a fantastic sports bar there as well. So you can sit there, puff on your cigar watch whatever uh you know races that you want sounds, or what have you it's that amazing sounds fantastic okay, oh, right. okay. this i gotta tell you this number one reason to live in las vegas you can smoke cigars most places <laughs> <laughs> all right I'm, I'm ridiculously excited okay next question and I mean, this is more like the newbie kind of getting into cigars type situation so there's a there's a great place here so i live in amsterdam and there's a great place here in amsterdam and all their cigars come from uh, nicaragua yes um and you walk in and it's this like just this huge room kind of humidor and there's just thousands of cigars to choose or hundreds of cigars to choose from and it's so overwhelming um and it's this what happens when you walk into any kind of cigar place right it's just so overwhelming of like where do i even start right so if you can help me kind of narrow it down a little bit of what i should be (laughs) like what questions should i be asking or what should i be looking for I'd yeah. really appreciate it. So I'm not looking for like a huge cigar. It's kind of like a, maybe a medium size, uh, something, you know, s- easy to smoke, smooth, kind of, you yeah. know, on the more beginner end of the scale. It's kind of how I describe it. Um, but what's the, like, when I kind of say that, I feel kind of stupid and I feel <laughs> like I'm just being led around by the sales guy and he's just selling me whatever he wants to get rid of. Like, how, sh- what questions should I ask and kind of what should I be steering towards? Yeah, if um, I mean, the good news about cigars is most people who enjoy them love teaching about them, too. So you can always ask, you know, any questions. And and there's people say there's no such thing as a stupid question. There absolutely are stupid questions, (laughs) but nobody's going to hate you for it because we're just happy to let you know what, you know, what you need to know so that we don't ask stupid questions again. It's um, no, the, the biggest thing for me is just understanding kind of the profile that that you like. Mm. Uh, so two questions. Whenever I, I've got maybe 300, 400 cigars in my humidor, and when somebody comes over and they ask for a cigar, you know, we're going to sit outside and smoke and, and grill or something. My first question is, how long do you want to smoke? Uh, because if they okay. want to smoke for an hour and a half, I'll give them a longer cigar. I'll give them a larger cigar, a slower burning cigar. Um, I've got some cigars that I really like because they're a pretty short smoke. They're like 20 minutes. So I can stand out there, get it done in 20 minutes. And it's just kind of, I'm quick. probably the, like, I, I don't smoke very often. So when I do, it's like an event. 
Uh, right. And I want to sit down and relax and just chill out and enjoy. So I'm kind of in the like the 45 minutes to an hour kind of yeah. time. I think after that, it gets a bit, I get a bit, it gets a bit much for me. But so I'm kind yeah. of in the, the 45 minutes to an hour range. And you probably want, I mean, the Nicaraguan cigars are amazing. They, um, you know, new modern Nicaraguan cigars are probably even better than old Cuban cigars, um, at least kind of by, mm. by my standards. I, I think that they tend to be better, but they also tend to be a lot smoother. So somebody who's not smoking all the time can smoke it and not start to feel sick after half an hour. Um, you know, so you get some of those really dark, like Maduro cigars or something, and they might taste fantastic, but if you're not used to it, that's a lot of nicotine, and a lot of flavor and a lot of punch all at once. Um, so you get something a little bit lighter. Again, a lot of the Nicaraguan one, Nicaraguan ones are just kind of naturally going to be smoother. Um, but, you know, honestly, when you go in somewhere, especially if you're going somewhere where they actually know what they're doing. I mean, one of the reasons mm -hmm. why I like Davidov of Geneva uh, on the Las Vegas Strip is you can go in there and even as somebody that smokes plenty of cigars, you can just start asking them, hey, what do you prefer? What do you like? And just start talking about your own flavor profile, your own kind of what you've liked in the past. And they'll point you towards things, even if it's just, hey, I had this particular cigar last time and I really liked it. Do you have something similar to that? And so, 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 so a question in on flavor profiles, because th this, my, my, my wife's a super taster, so she can like, just take a mouthful of something and just give you every ingredient that's in it. And I'm the opposite end of the scale. I can do, this is spicy or this is not spicy, right? That that's literally all I've got. Right. What's, what should like, cause obviously the, you know, I I'm saying smooth, but that's, I don't know. Is that the right terminology? Should I be saying something else? Like, how should I? Yeah describe smooth, what i'm looking for smooth is good i um the the real flavors that you're kind of looking for is you know there's you've got some cigars that are going to be very nutty um so they they taste i mean i don't know how else to say nutty but they they definitely have a very earthy <laughs> taste to it sure. um you'll have some that one of my favorites is a, a very very light cigar and again it's made by a company called warped and it's relatively small um when you first light it up, it's almost got like a hay profile to, to the smell. I mean, when you, when you take that smoke in to your mouth, it reminds you of walking through a field full of hay. Um, and it's, it's kind of interesting. So when you're smoking a cigar, what I like to do is what I should probably do more often is even if you have a journal or something and just write down as you're smoking, things that it reminds you of, uh, you know, mm. a big heavy Maduro might remind you of chocolate or a red wine or something. Um, another one might remind you kind of a, a vanilla or maybe caramel or, or what have you. And from that, you'll be able to start looking at patterns and you'll start saying, Oh, you know, these, these last three cigars that I've had all really kind of remind me of macadamia nuts for some reason. Like why is, and, and really uh. there's no wrong way to describe the flavor. This is one of the things I love. Um, I don't know if you subscribe to Cigar Aficionado, but you can read through there and they've got their terms, kind of universal mm. terms that every cigar smoker will know. But start reading the in-depth reviews and they talk about it in a very kind of personal, casual way. Uh, you know, this this one reminds me of iced tea on a summer evening, you know. And, and so when you say smooth, most people are going to think two things. The draw is relatively smooth. You don't have to pull too hard for it. Mm. You know, it's just kind of the smoke just comes right through the cigar and they're going to think not harsh. So not a real spicy smoke or something, uh, kind of a more mild, uh, yeah. flavor to it. And most people, when you say smooth, they'll know that that's what you're talking about are those that mix of two things. Okay. Okay. So I'm, 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 I'm I was circling. I was close. I was close. <laughs> okay. That's good to know. Um, wonderful. I'm so I'm just, making notes uh bear with me one second uh right i've got that now um question from john was what's your favorite whiskey um oh there are too many uh one of my favorite ones i so being an american i'm supposed to like bourbon but i actually uh bourbon's I've, not my favorite you, you're about to walk into the trap uh -oh. i've been given very explicit notes that if bourbon comes up and you don't say you you're only allowed to say Van Winkle. Otherwise, I've got to hang up is literally what John said. before. Well, as far as bourbons go, Van Winkle would probably be up there. 
Uh, my favorite is actually the one that I've been drinking the most is a rye, and it is Whistle Pig. And Whistle Pig oh, okay. rye is is fantastic. They they make a bourbon as well, I think. But um, I actually really like their rye, and just the flavor profile difference between rye and bourbon is rye is going to be a little bit spicier. Um, and that's Whistle Pig's probably one of my favorites. Other than that, I will do scotch occasionally because again scotch goes so well with a nice smoky cigar but um but my general go-to whiskey is going to be a rye I, I just think that they tend to be a little bit cleaner than some of the other varieties out there got it got it and what's the with rye is it ice no ice like, uh, i do, do ice and just a little drop of water um okay. i know some people will kind of scoff at that and they say that you ought to just do whiskey neat. And that's the only way that you, you know, like a cowboy or something. Um, my thought process is I really want to be able to enjoy it. And you add just a little mm. bit of water in there and it opens it up. Um, all of a sudden you get so much more flavor. So a little bit of ice, a little bit of water and then sip on it. And it's fantastic. That, that being said, I'm also a sucker. Anytime I go to a new restaurant or I go to a new bar, the way I judge the bartender is I'll ask for an old fashioned made with rye. And if they do a good old fashioned, that's going to be a place I keep on going back to forever. If they come back with an old fashioned that is overly syrupy and sickeningly sweet, I'm like, you just ruined my whiskey and I can no longer stay there. So where's your go-to place in Vegas? Since we're just recommending places now, where's your go-to place for old fashions in Vegas? Um, as far as old fashions go, actually the cigar bar uh, does okay. amazing old fashions. They do fantastic. There's also a bar at the, bottom of the Cromwell. Uh, so the Cromwell is right across from Caesar's palace and it's a smaller kind of boutique style, uh, mm -hmm. hotel. I think it's still owned by Caesar's, but they've got a little bar right there on the floor that you can smoke cigars and sit there and drink and sip. And it's great people watching cause there's a club up at the top. And so you get to watch everybody going into the club and it's fantastic people watching if you enjoy making fun of folks. Um, they do a fantastic old fashioned, but they also do a really great corpse reviver, which is an absinthe rinse. Uh, so you do an absinthe rinse in a martini glass. And then I believe it's King of Lillette. Uh, I think you've got some gin and something else. Um, maybe a little bit of brandy or something to make it sweet. Uh, and corpse revivers are kind of this whole slew of different types of cocktails and you can make them different ways. Uh, they were, Back in the Prohibition days, they called them corpse revivers because you would have it as a hangover cure. And one of my favorite sayings about it is, they're great for killing a hangover, but if you have more than three, you're going to unrevive your corpse. So. <laughs> I love it. Okay, I've got that noted. Uh, I've never had a corpse revival. That's, I've never even heard of it. It's brilliant. Um, fantastic. And then um, I think we should absolutely touch on your creative agency as well. Um, yeah. So what kind of creative stuff do you do? What's going on? Um, biggest thing, yeah, I break it down into three different sections. I do uh, digital art and graphic design. Uh, we also do photography and videography and content like that for folks. And then we do coaching. The overall drive of the agency is helping brands tell their story. Uh, okay. the way that I explain it is everybody's got a story to tell, but nobody's listening to you. So how do we get people to listen to you? Well, you have to tell the right story in the right way. And so we try to help folks. Usually we started off actually as mostly consultants, uh, mostly coaching folks. I come from the nonprofit world. So there was a lot of experience there trying to get people to pay attention to what you're doing. Mm. Um, and still help a lot with public advocacy organizations and nonprofits and occasionally some political causes, but, uh, really we're open up to anybody. I mean, any business that wants to get out there and learn a little bit more about how to communicate their ideas. Uh, so it's been fun. It's been a journey. We've, I started about a year and a half ago, two years ago now, I guess. Um, so it's relatively new, but it's been, it's been fun and it allows me to do the creative stuff that I like, uh, you know, all the graphic design. It lets me go out there with my camera and take pictures and create videos. And it's, it's been entertaining and yeah, it's, uh, it's the type of work that I tell people it's made up. Um, you know, most of us, <laughs> most of us, you know, would never think of this as a job. So you just go out there and say, Hey, what can I do to help you sell your stuff? Uh, and, and it's, we've gotten pretty good response. And so what, what kind of clients do you work with? Uh, again, mostly public advocacy folks, but that's 
because that was kind of my sphere of influence. That was the network that I already had when, when I got into this. Uh, we have had a couple of private businesses that are just looking for certain things. I mean, we, uh, I went out and did a bunch of photography for a tattoo artist. She's related to me. So that's how I know her, but, uh, you know, nonetheless, we did that building a website for, uh, somebody else who's doing metal fabrication. I mean, it kind of runs the gamut, but, uh, mostly public advocacy, just because that seems to be where there's a real need for how do I get people to pay attention to and care about my cause? Um, so often when you're selling a physical good, it's, it seems almost easier to get people to pay attention when you're selling an idea or a cause, mm. it takes a little bit more effort to get people to really invest in, in you because they don't see an immediate return. It's not like buying shoes on the internet. You know, you're giving money to somebody so that way they can do good in the world. It takes time, right? It's, it, it's, it's brand building effectively, which takes, it's a slow, that's a slow burn. Ultimately. Yeah. Yeah. And trying to get people to pay attention to, uh, you know, to things that aren't necessarily part of their everyday life. Uh, you know, during the last legislative session, actually one of the clients that I had give scholarships to low income kids so that way they can Brilliant. get into you know, better schools. And it is amazing to me how they're one of the biggest scholarship organizations in Nevada and almost nobody even knows their name. So we did a little campaign during the legislative session, went out, found some of these parents, got their story on video, did some, uh, kind of advocacy videos telling the legislature, Hey, this, this, uh, organization exists and you should pay attention to them because they're doing great for the children in the communities. And, uh, that was a fun project because obviously it's something that's important, but also as important as it was up until we were doing that, nobody really even knew this organization was out there acting in this way. So it's, uh, that type of stuff is what I really enjoy doing. So kind of like humanizing it, telling the, the individual story, bringing that to life really yeah. kind of explains, which, which is hilarious, because, not hilarious, but it's the connections are quite funny. So last week we had a public advocacy consultant on and mm. we were talking about gambling legislation in the UK and some of the issues there. And his advice was to like, we, you know, does uh, the gambling industry will talk about, oh, if we legislate too much, people will go offshore and gamble with all these dodgy companies and and it's kind of this kind of scary boogeyman and Dr. Harga Aker's recommendation was like, you need to humanize it. You need to tell the stories of the people who've been affected. And you, in a completely different, coming in from a completely different project, you've essentially done the same thing. So I love the, yeah. it's, um, that's fantastic. That's the, fantastic. The way I always explain it to folks is he, every single one of us is telling a story um, just through living our life, the clothes that you decide to wear, the political causes you decide to believe in, all of that is you telling the world who you are. And so if you understand that, then if you've got an organization that wants to get out there and get known and, or they've got a political advocacy cause that they want to mm. gin up support for, you have to say, okay, the people that you're talking to are the people that you want to talk to. What is the story that they're telling about their own lives? And then you find, how do I fit into that story? How am I a part of that story? And as soon as you make that connection, then to the people that you're talking to, you're not some ab abstract brand. You're not some company out there doing something good you are literally part of their narrative as to how the world should operate. And all of a sudden they become huge advocates for your cause. Whereas before, yeah, even if they thought that you did good, they, they might not pay a whole lot of attention to you because you were just this other entity and we all pay more attention to our own lives than we do to other people's lives. For sure. For sure. Um, when you lay it out like that, it sounds really simple. <laughs> but it feels like there's a lot of work behind the scenes. It's got like the duck kind of gliding along, but actually the legs are kind of going like crazy. Yeah. But, it's so it's like when marketers or advertisers are like, oh, well, you know, just, uh, you know, send out these couple advertisements on uh, social media and you'll know, build your brand right away. And it's like, yeah, okay. I've been on social media. Sometimes it's difficult to get some retweets, you know, it's, there's obviously extra steps. You're not telling me. Just, just do something like that. Apple ads. That was really good. That yeah, worked, right? Yeah, just, just copy that one. It'll be fun. It'll be fun. I love it. Brilliant. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for all your top tips. I'm going to look everything up and plan out my itinerary um, really well. Um, we'll be keeping an eye on your um, columns in the uh, Nevada Independent as well. The, do, you, do you write anywhere else or is it just the Nevada Independent? Um, I'm a weekly columnist at the Nevada Independent. Uh, and then occasionally I will show up other places um, as a guest columnist. Uh, usually the best place to 
follow my stuff if you want to get kind of a yeah. fuller view of all my writing. If you go to the my Substack, which is creativediscourse.substack.com, um, most of it's focused kind of around the comms work that I do, around the idea of creativity and around the idea of getting out there and telling your story. But I will include links to a lot of the work that I write elsewhere, just because usually it's tangentially related to the idea of getting out there and persuading the world. Fantastic. We'll absolutely add the links um, so people can find that easily. Excellent. So, uh, Michael, thank you so much for your time. And it's been great to meet you. Yeah, yeah it's been a pleasure. Thank you. If you've enjoyed this episode of the Gambling Files podcast, please find us on LinkedIn. Give us a big, juicy, succulent like. That nearly went wrong. Um, You can find us under the name The Gambling Files Podcast. You find us on Twitter under The Gambling Files. I think the handle is just at Gambling Files. You can connect to myself, John Bruford, or Finton Costello, also on LinkedIn. We're also both on Twitter. And... You can find all of our previous episodes at www.thegamblingfiles.com. If you enjoyed it, uh, please share, tell your friends, tell your family, tell your colleagues, and we'll see you next time.